Time for this week's difficult conversation. Rachel Williams is a leading advocate in the campaign against domestic violence. She endured 18 years of abuse in 2011. She tried to leave her husband and six weeks later, he shot her at her workplace. Her husband subsequently died by suicide. She then spent six weeks in hospital recovering from her injuries. But three days after Rachel was discharged from hospital, a 16-year-old son, Jake, took his own life. Rachel is now the founder of Stand Up to Abuse and has changed the sector, spreading awareness, sharing resources and stories to help those in need. And some of the images that you may see during this segment may be somewhat distressing. Well, I'm pleased to say that I'm joined in the studio by the founder of Stand Up to Domestic Abuse, Rachel Williams. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me. See, looking at you now, no one would have any idea that the sort of journey that you've been through. Can you tell me a bit about your story? Yeah, I think, sadly, society got um, a sort of blinkered view of what a victim should look like. You know, somebody from a lower demographic, you know, somebody couldn't be in a possibly powerful position or, you know, work in nine till five. So I was with a perpetrator of abuse, not realising he was a, a perpetrator of abuse. Um, and as I say, you know, if, if somebody slapped you on the first date, you certainly wouldn't go back for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I was groomed by my perpetrator, um, ended up in a relationship with him, um, realised he had um, a, a bit of a temper, um, violent, and the first time I can recall that was when I was seven months pregnant and he lifted me off the floor by my wow. throat and he let me go when my lips turned blue. And that was actually his words after. Um, but how, how long into the relationship did he show these sort of tendencies? I would probably say 10 months in. Really? Yeah, and because he always used to speak about his childhood, uh, he came from an abusive household, which is well documented in all the reports. Mm. Um, I did feel sorry for him, and I thought, you know, I could help him um, and basically change him. And I think that's what a lot, a lot of victims and survivors do, think that they can actually help their perpetrator with all these problems mm. and we can fix them. Mm. So when was the first time... He said about nine months, but what was it that he did that made you think, hang on a minute? Um, it was the way he used to speak to me and sometimes, you know, he'd say, right, I'll come down for food, I'll come for a meal, and he didn't show up. Mm. You know, all these little red, red flags that I, I'm more aware of now because I work in the sector, mm. um, but at the time I, I wasn't aware of it. Um, and then, like I said, the, the significant moment for the abuse for me was when I was pregnant, seven months pregnant with his child. Mm, and how long in were you pregnant, being with him? Um, I was with him. Uh, this is this is quite funny, actually, because perpetrators of abuse tend to do that, tend to sort of get you in their clutches. So I was probably with him only about a year before I fell pregnant right. for, for Jack. Wow. And so, of course, you, you had a son. Yeah. Um, during your pregnancy, what was that like? Um, it was all right. It was hard going sometimes because I had a two-year-old as well who um, wasn't Darren's. Um, you know, Darren always sort of looked after Darren and things that he wanted to do. You know, he used to go training five times a week. You know, and when Jack came, nothing changed for him. You know, I was getting up doing the night feeds and he was still going training, doing the things he wanted to do. He worked on the door. Um, so things for Darren didn't change, but, you know, it became very hard work because basically I had three children then. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, talk to me about the situation that led to you being shot. So, I built up the courage to finally leave him, and this was after he'd strangled me, um, and then he slit his wrist in front of our 16-year-old son, and that was when the fear of staying with him uh, became greater than the fear of leaving him. So I finally decided, you know, enough's enough. Um, I always knew there was going to be a consequence of some description, because he used to say to me, there's only one way out for you, and that's in a wooden box. He used to write things in cards like that, we're going to be together in this life and the next. Oh, okay. Very dark, sinister cards. So I did leave him, uh, filed for divorce for the six-week period uh, before the shooting. He stalked and harassed me, which wasn't picked up by my police force of stalking, um, you know, and he was sat hanging inside my place of work. You know, one, one time he phoned me 34 times in a day without wow. text messages. Um, it was horrendous. And then... Um, I can remember then he, he got arrested for common assault for the strangulation, hence why I pushed to get non-fatal strangulation as a standalone charge. Um, and he was charged with common assault. The lay magistrates lifted all the bail restrictions the day before the shooting, knowing it was all on file. He was a serial perpetrator. He threatened to kill me. He'd already had a conviction for firearms. So all, all the, the information was there for those dealing with the case, um, but yet they still failed us miserably. And then I went to work on the 19th of August 2011. 
Um, just finished cutting a lady's hair. The shop went really dark. Um, as I looked to the door to see what was blocking out the sunlight, mm -hmm. and Darren was six foot seven, 22 stone, oh. a 60 inch chest. He was a big guy. And as I looked to the door, Darren was walking into the salon and he was doing this and pulling out uh, a bag, uh, a, a gun out of this bag he was carrying. And I can remember just running towards him um, and grappling with him for the gun. He hit me on the head with a bit of the gun. Um, kicked the reception desk um, over and it was only the fact that I'd had presence of mind to pull my knees up under my chin. Uh, he stood about four feet away from me, told me he loved me, pulled the trigger. My left leg took the first blast mm -hmm. um, and the second blast skimmed past my ear. He then put the gun down, I believe, to reload and I can remember grabbing the gun and at that point he I had some sort of supernatural strength and he couldn't retrieve the gun from me, so he just absolutely pounded me with kicks, oh punches, uh, everything. Then the next thing, he was gone. Um, and then I was taken to hospital, got told later on in the evening that they'd found him. He'd um, taken his own life, um, which was a blessing. You know, I'm not going to say anything other than it was a blessing because otherwise I would have had to have been in witness protection all my life because there was no way he'd let me go. Um, and then, as you said, you know, I came out of hospital on the 23rd of September 2011 on the Friday and Jack took his life on the Monday. No, I don't even know how you go through that. I mean, your own journey and what you've been through to then find out that your son has yeah. taken his own life. What does that do to you? Um, you, it, it, it did destroy me, you know, but then as time goes on, it, time is a healer and you don't get over it, but you learn to live with it. And I think the fire in my belly is to make change to the system because constantly victims and survivors of, of domestic abuse and violence are being failed miserably by the system. Hence why I've got all these petitions uh, going at the moment um, around, you know, family, co um, family courts, which is horrendous. Um, I was fortunate to give that petition into Theresa May and that's got 220 odd thousand signatures. But it's not just the signatures, though, Nana, it's the horror stories that go with it. People have put their own experiences of family court. A lady contacted me the other week and she told me that the magistrate in family court told her she could not have possibly been strangled because she was still here. You know, you've got comments being said like that. The other one is around taking domestic violence seriously in court. This is, um, I started this in March 2017. It's got 321,000 signatures on. And I started that on the back of a Judge Mansell. He had a case in his court and the victim was hit with a cricket bat and the, uh, and, um, the perpetrator tried to make a drink bleach. The judge told her he, he, she wasn't deemed vulnerable enough because she had a degree in a network of friends. He didn't give the perpetrator a custodial sentence because he had a promising cricket career ahead of him. That's just ridiculous. So that was in 2017. I re relaunched it last year on the back of all the comments that are still being said in what, court. What is the purpose? Of, where, where are you going to go with this? I want, I want all judges mm -hmm. and magistrates to have mandatory specialist, consistent training because they absolutely desperately need it. I've got a friend who's a magistrate and thankfully she knows mm -hmm. everything about domestic abuse and violence. She nearly stepped down the other week in court because her two colleagues on the bench wanted to bail a, a really dangerous perpetrator and she said if you do, she said I will be overseeing a, a homicide. She said this will be a homicide. So I know that they need the, the, the why, training. Why do you think that this doesn't seem to be taken that, that seriously? I mean, you know, it seems to be yeah, you'll be all right. It's not that serious. It just, you know, he's not really going to do anything. And it's usually men that's yeah, perpetrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, we know in March 2021 that 92% of defendants in domestic, in uh, criminal court in domestic abuse cases were men. So, you know, men, men are the problem. You know, we do know that men do get, you know, um, abused by others as well. But, you know, mainly it's predominantly men. Um, but, yeah, I just think it's training. I just mm. think there's a lack of knowledge, a lack of training. You know, the government keeps saying, you know, they're ploughing in this money into this, that and the other. You know, I've had three appointments made with the Home Secretary mm. to give these petitions in. Two with Priti Patel, which were cancelled, and one with Suella Braverman. Again, on the 14th of February, the day before I was supposed to go up to London, you know, bring them up, it was cancelled. That's terrible. That shows to me that they've got, they've got, they, they, they just don't care. 
so something really needs to be done about this yeah. because it's not acceptable, is it? No, it's not. And so it's become your life's mission to sort yes. this out. Talk to me about your, your other children then, because you've got two other children. No, just one other children. Other child. uh, one other, well, he's not a child, he's an adult, he's 32. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so he's um, he sort of like, sort of keeps out of it and he's just getting on, you know, with life. Uh, he was scared by obviously living with in that toxic environment. Um, and But thankfully, you know, Darren wasn't his father. Um, but, you know, we, we miss Jack every day. But, mm -hmm. you know, for me, this, this is my mission now. Until I see an end to domestic abuse and violence, I'm going to keep on keeping on. And, and your injuries as well from the shooting? Yeah. Are you, are you still dealing with them or are they...? So I've got 20 grand worth of titanium in my leg. Uh, the hospital did want to take it off, which would have been an amputation above the knee, and I told them absolutely no way. I was 39, you know, who wants to lose a limb at 39 if there's a possibility of saving it? I mean, the, the surgeons in Swansea Hospital were amazing and they did manage to save my leg. Um, but, yeah, you've just got to get on with it. You can't be pitiful and powerful. You've got to, you've got to choose a party. I like that. You can't be pitiful and powerful. You have to choose a party. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me. If people want to find out more or, or get involved with your petitions, do you have somewhere they can go? On my website, www.sutda, standuptodomesticabuse.org, everything's on there, Anna. Rachel, you're an absolute inspiration. Thank you so much for thank joining me. Thank you. That, of course, is Rachel Williams. She's the founder of Stand Up to Domestic Abuse. Now, if you're having difficulty or having a difficult time, you can contact the Samaritans uh, day or night, 365 days a year. Uh, you can call them for free on 116123 and email them at joe at samaritans or, uh, .org or visit www.samaritans.org to find your nearest branch. The details are at the bottom of the screen.